Hello everyone! I've got a book review for you today. I'd like to take a few minutes to share my thoughts on one of the more prominent works of Star Trek fanfiction, The Eugenics Wars, The Rise and Fall of Khan Noonien Singh, Volumes 1 and 2, by Greg Cox. As you can probably tell, this duology, published in 2001-2002, revolves around the genetically enhanced Superman Khan, the antagonist of the original series episode Space Seed, and of the 1982 film Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. A few years ago, I reviewed another Star Trek book by Greg Cox, Terrain in Hell, which explores Khan's exile on SETI Alpha 5. According to some people, that book is actually a sequel to these ones, making it a trilogy, but I really, really, really liked that book, and I've always been curious to see what Cox did with Khan's origin story. Plus, eugenics is one of those extremely interesting, controversial topics about which I have very strong opinions, so I wanted to see how Cox handled it. These books go back in time to Khan's early childhood as one of the products of the Chrysalis Project, and then closes with him being put in cryosleep on the SS Botany Bay. That is not a spoiler, <laughs> you know that's where it's gonna end up. First things first, the cover art. It is attention-grabbing. They obviously used Ricardo Montalban's likeness, though they didn't make much of an effort to de-age him. On both covers, Khan looks roughly the same as he did in Space Seed, despite the fact that for the bulk of both books, he's considerably younger. Like Terrain in Hell did, this has a frame story device with the crew of the Enterprise. A planet has petitioned to join the Federation, but the Federation is hesitating because of their involvement in genetic engineering. So Captain Kirk is headed there to assess the situation, and on the way, he refreshes his memory about the eugenics wars. While it was nice to see these characters included, and everybody gets uh, everybody gets at least a cursory mention, and Kirk, McCoy, and Spock are all featured somewhat prominently, Spock a little bit less so. Um, I could have done without this extra layer of storytelling. Whenever it would switch from the primary narrative back to this, it just felt like a disruption. The main time period of the story is 1974 to the mid-1990s, and the real protagonists are Gary Seven and Roberta Lincoln, characters from the original series episode Assignment Earth, which was made as a pilot for a possible spin-off series. That idea never came to fruition, but it has intrigued Star Trek fans ever since. Gary Seven, who you are welcome to envision as Robert Lansing, is himself a genetically engineered human, so that's an interesting contrast. He was raised by aliens on another planet and works covertly on Earth to avert disaster and global destruction. Roberta Lincoln, who you can picture as Terry Garr, is his young female recruit, who usually takes on a secret agent role. She is the main viewpoint character, and Isis, a black cat with unusual powers and abilities, makes it a a trio. In general, I liked the books, but I did find them somewhat challenging to get through at times. My biggest problem was that they were both so long. <laughs> They're about 400 pages each, which in and of itself isn't an issue. I am capable of reading long books. <laughs> but Cox has a tendency to go into unnecessary details. I considered them unnecessary. He over-describes, over-explains, and he includes characters' private thoughts and quips. A lot of quips. And to me, that's what makes it feel so long. It made me restless. I felt each chapter could have been two to three pages shorter. And I know that doesn't sound like much, but if the first volume has 35 chapters or so, that's about 70 to 100 pages of excess. He does pack in a lot of content, maybe too much. <laughs> the first volume felt like two books in one. There's a climax in the middle that just screams finale, and it would be an awesome finale. But then it was crazy to think I was only halfway through. 
Um, the book basically starts over after that and is really just one huge transition period building up to the second book. There's more to it than that, but where the first half, which I really liked, felt like a standalone story, the second half felt like it was trying not to just be filler. <laughs> uh, the second book started out well, um, but then I... I lost interest during the middle, <laughs> and that that's ironic to me because that's where the eugenics wars actually take off. So that's not a great sign. <laughs> it did pick up again, and I enjoyed the big finish, and I think both books wrapped up nicely and were pretty good overall. But I say that with some reservations. Another thing is that the books are constantly going wink wink nudge nudge to the reader. They're loaded with real life events. There's an awful lot of political commentary. <laughs> Wasn't keen on that. There are many cutesy pop culture references. And of course, there's a plethora of Star Trek Easter eggs. And most of them should be accessible even to more casual fans. I feel like if I was able to pick them up, then you don't have to be a die-hard Trekkie to catch them. Included are significant nods to the original series episodes The Trouble with Tribbles and Tomorrow is Yesterday, and there's a major Star Trek IV tie-in, but it's not limited to the original series. There are also references to the Q, the Borg, the Ferengi, Guinan, someone opens a bottle of Chateau Picard, Cox is clever with his illusions. He comes up with names that have oblique Star Trek connections. Walter Nichols, for example, which I think is supposed to be a combination of Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols. There's also a battle scene, I was quite proud of myself for picking up on this one, <laughs> where a doctor comes forward to treat the wounded and the doctor's name is Dr. Hoyt. A little bell went off in my head when I read that, and I was like, Dr. Hoyt? As in John Hoyt, who played the ship's doctor in The Cage, the first Star Trek pilot episode? That's a deep cut! <laughs> Most of the references were amusing, and he does a fine job weaving them in. But I will say that at times it seemed like Cox was just throwing all the low-hanging fruit in there, and I wished he'd get on with it. <laughs> but maybe that's because I wasn't looking so much for a fun adventure slash trivia game. What I wanted was a disturbing sci-fi thriller about test tube babies trying to take over the world. It just so happens to be... Star Trek related about one of the most iconic villains that we've ever had. I did get that. Despite all this other stuff, the focus is more or less on Khan, the alpha male to beat all alpha males. He's introduced to us as four-year-old Noon, the precocious little boy who's top of his class of superhuman toddlers. He gradually transforms into an antagonist, and that transition is pretty good. Uh, I, I thought um, Cox did a good job with the development. Teenage Noon is an arrogant, almost insufferable brat. I did laugh at the comment about his extremely well-developed chest, far more muscular than any 14-year-old boy's pectoral muscles usually are. <laughs> it was kind of weird, um, but I, I got what he was, what he was doing. It's funny. As a headstrong young man, Khan starts out with the intention of using his power to set the world to rights, running it the way it should be run instead of leaving it in the hands of incompetent morons. But of course that objective changes as his disdain for the weak human race increases. I thought Greg Cox did a fairly good job with the character as a younger person, though I can't decide if he intended him to be as obnoxious as he was. This certainly didn't make me think, oh, you know, this whole eugenics thing, it actually has some good aspects to it. 
But I am staunchly opposed to the theory and practice of eugenics to begin with. I think it's an insidious, evil thing because it's really just a slippery slope. To powerful, intellectual elitists, it sounds great because they're going to be at the top of the food chain. And when they talk about it, they have a way of making it sound altruistic. But it's not. Genetic engineering and enhancement, or the breeding of a master race, inevitably creates a group of people with a superiority complex that believes its special members have more rights than anyone else, and they're bound to come to the conclusion that all the inferior, lowly, common people are just making a mess of the world. And wouldn't it be better for everyone if we just cull the herd? It's dangerous, it's a scary thing, not just because it's people playing God, but because it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to genocide. For over a hundred years, there have been people pushing the eugenics idea. They usually do it quietly, using a variety of methods to make skeptics feel more comfortable with the idea. They make it sound like charity. Um, they talk about overpopulation, hereditary diseases, quality of life. But the solution they're actually driving toward is disturbing. In the end, I came away with a sense that yes, this could be a way that the eugenics wars went down, this could be what Khan's life on Earth was like, but I don't feel that it is the way things happened. Cox's version of events didn't become headcanon for me. And that was not the case with Terrain and Hell. There were a few things in that book that really, really made sense to me, really stuck with me, to the extent that when I watch Star Trek II, I think about those things. I also felt mixed about the frame story. It gives the book the opportunity to have an ethical debate, discussing the pros and cons of genetic engineering. But it also felt like shoot-in fan service, like it had to be there because it wouldn't have been a proper original series related novel without including the crew of the Enterprise. The book does successfully demonstrate, however, just how powerful and threatening Khan became at the height of his control, how close he came to wiping out the entire population, and why he poses such a threat when he resurfaces in space seed and later in Star Trek II. It gives even more explanation for why, when Chekhov realizes he and Captain and Terrell have stumbled across the Botany Bay, he's like, we gotta get out of here. Plus, it is an entertaining read. It covers a lot of ground, it has some creative sequences. I thought that the first half of book one was especially good, and uh, it's got all those references. Some of the Easter eggs make you chuckle, some might make you roll your eyes, but not in disgust, it's more just like a Ah, oh, I see what you're doing there, kind of thing. Even though I didn't love the books, and there were some things I wish were perhaps done differently, I'm really glad I finally got to read them, and I want to say a special thank you to Banesh for making it happen. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you have read these books, I'd love to hear your take on them, so I hope you'll feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll be back soon. Thanks for watching. Bye! You gotta do it. You know, you can't do a con-related video and not do that. It's just obligatory. <laughs>